G'day and welcome back to Talking Leadership. This is Eric Perez welcoming you to the second week of podcasts. Thanks again for joining me and my guest today is a program manager for Young Change Agents. He's also a regional liaison for Sourdough Business Pathways and has held other uh, leadership positions across a range of sectors. I'd like to welcome to the podcast today, Sam Refshorgi. Fantastic podcast, a lot to unpack in the discussion with Sam. Sam was quite open in terms of his views of leadership and the values therein. Thanks again for joining me and uh, over to Sam. Sound well, Sam, thank you for joining me, mate. How are you, buddy? Yeah, I'm really good. Thanks, Eric. How are you going? Mate, I'm good. Let, before we get into the podcast proper, give us a bit of a background to what you're doing at the moment, mate. Yeah, thanks uh, for the introduction and thanks for having me on the show. I guess at the moment what I'm doing first and foremost is learning to be a father, a leader in the uh, in the home, so to speak. We've got a, uh, a little 17-month-old baby girl who's, I guess, not so much a baby anymore. She's a little toddler running around, talking and walking and learning how to lead herself and lead the rest of us in the house so so yeah i'm trying to dedicate as much time as to as i can to uh to being with her and looking after her and then on a work front i split myself across a couple of different organizations i work uh delivering social entrepreneurship education programs for young people and teachers with an organization called young change agents and then i also uh, work in a le- regional liaison uh, role with a local nonprofit called so- Saudo Business Pathways, trying to support local entrepreneurs and small businesses to scale and grow across the Northern Rivers region, which is where I live now. That entrepreneurial scene that you're involved in, is that something that you've built up over time? Is it something you stumbled into? Like, how, how, did, how did you get into that as part of what you do for work, mate? It's probably a bit, bit of a mix of both, to be honest. I studied... Uh, commerce. So I did a, a Bachelor of Commerce at University of New South Wales um, about a decade ago. So have a, I guess, a business background in terms of what I studied. Um, but my my vision was to try and get into tourism. I wanted to run a resort on a tropical island and live the Richard Branson style life. And I thought that could that could get me towards that. But so quickly realised that the world of hospitality and tourism isn't as glamorous as uh, what it is when you're a rich guest. And so quickly quickly worked out that that wasn't going to be for me. And was lucky enough to get some incredible opportunities to get insight and experience, I guess, in the world of nonprofit and the world of entrepreneurship. First sort of taste of that was uh, through a, a team building and events, a corporate events company called Adrenaline, where I was a, uh, a, a client manager and so organized incentive trips for, um, for staff members of big companies to go and reward them for different things that they got to do. So really creative and innovative ways of trying to keep people engaged and excited within organizations. And through that time actually went within the organization, went through their their journey of going into financial administration, which for a recent business graduate was probably the most incredible case study, real life case study of what business could look like uh, when things go wrong. And I was just sitting in the middle of it as a junior uh, employee at the time it was incredible, incredible, incredible insight into leadership, management, success, failure, all of those things that you that you hear about at university, but don't really think to experience in your first year out of uh, out of the place. That sort of ended up when I got a great opportunity to go over to Indonesia through an Australian government program that at the time was called the Australian Youth Ambassadors for Development. I went over to uh, Jakarta, Indonesia, to work with the Indonesian Rugby Union over there, um, which to be honest, I had no, no idea even existed. And myself, my rugby playing career was pretty uh, average at best. <laughs> I'd done a bit of coaching and, and played a little bit and loved it, but by no means were in a position that I should be running a rugby union of a, uh, of a 380 million people country or however many people are in, uh, in Indonesia, 280 maybe. Don't quote me on the numbers. But anyway, I guess that was my sort of, that my next, introduction into the world of entrepreneurship you get over there find a a opportunity you build a collective group of people around you and you try and make something work to become you try and try and achieve a vision that um that either you and others around you set out to try to achieve so so did that for for 12 months had a great experience there and then was trying to work out coming back to australia what my career path could look like and 
luckily at the same time, a, a couple of people within my close network of, of friends and connections in Sydney at the time were starting up some incredible nonprofit organisations, the first of which was called AIM, the, the Australian Indigenous Mentoring Experience, um, which I worked within for, for four or five years, ending up as the general manager as it grew and scaled across uh, the country to work with thousands of university students and thousands of Indigenous high school kids trying to close the educational gap um, and that inequality between Indigenous and non-Indigenous high school student. And then from there, I got the great opportunity to take over as CEO of a youth mental health organisation called Batir, which uh, we started up a few years before then. And uh, the founder asked me to, to take over in 2015, uh, where I then worked as CEO for three years. So that last, I guess, 10 years for me has been, um, been an incredible ride of different entrepreneurial experiences um, in different shapes and forms, um, a lot very non-traditional, um, but all threaded together with with some sort of loose theme that has got me to, to where I am today. When, mate, you, you use the word non-traditional, do you mean because it's social entrepreneurship, not um, entrepreneurship as it's understood, money in, in that corporate sense rather than in the not-for-profit social entrepreneurial space? Yeah, I think that's one part of it. Um, traditionally, you learn in, in a business degree that cash is king and profit is the most important uh, outcome, I guess, for, for running a business. So, so one side of the non-traditional factor is the social focus. Um, but for me, I se I've seen that always as an incredible opportunity. And you know, I've always been able to make a living through working within and, and with organisations that are having a, uh, a really positive impact on the world around us. And so that's, for, for me, um, a win-win situation. But also, I guess, you know, going, going over to Indonesia, then coming back and jumping into an organisation that was growing so rapidly, excuse me, um, and moving into to management and leadership positions really early before I or we really knew what was going on, I guess is also a bit of a non-traditional uh, way to uh, to earn your stripes or, or learn your craft, so to speak. It's, it's, it's uh, interesting that you did that early in the career. A lot of people I've spoken to, and I'll, I'll let myself in this group of people, particularly in, in the some of the um, people that I've been speaking to on the podcast, is that, yeah, you, you end up there after, a, after building a career, whereas it sounds like you got hit with the reverse of it and you got it a lot younger than most people. And um, I, it, it, it makes for a couple of interesting questions here, and I, I might combine a couple of things that are going on in my head at the moment. So I'm, I'm going to make some assumptions here and, and cut me down if I've assumed too much, but um, let, let me preface my, my, my next question with the following. So from what I've, what I've seen of, of, of the kind of roles that you've had and what you've just talked about now, I'm assuming that you have met with leaders and entrepreneurs of different stripes in your travels. Do you believe that there is a difference? And, and here's a new sort of theme I'm, I'm trying to test out. And it's, it's a single question in three parts, I guess, is... Do you believe that there's a difference between a leader in an organisation, an entrepreneur that might be connected to it and the management function in that organisation? So are they see three separate things or are they highly connected or not so connected? What, what's your view of that, mate? So in, in terms of the preface, I think you're right. Like I've, one, of the, one of the great opportunities I've had in life is to come into contact with an incredible amount of entrepreneurs and leaders in different shapes and forms and something I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have learned from. I think to be honest, so, so the question I guess for me is, is, the, is leadership and management and entrepreneurship one thing or different things within an organisation? Is that, yeah. is that yeah. sort of what you're going for? Look, to be honest, I think it depends on the skill set and the personality and characteristics of the individual. I think you can be a great manager and a great leader and really entrepreneurial if you happen to have all of the skills and qualities of those uh, roles and the ability and capacity to play each of those when each is necessary. I think each skill set is very different and one being good at one does not give you the ability to be good at the other. 
And so I think within organisations, it is safer to try and divide up those skill sets into different people in different roles who have those strengths to be more in a leadership position versus the managerial operational side of what needs to get done versus the innovative entrepreneurial spark that sits across those two things and should be within those roles but not isn't necessarily uh, there all the time is is an outcome of innovation and an outcome of an effective business a combination of taking everyone with you or is it um in your experience something that's come from the entrepreneur or the leader themselves and then sort of diffused down through the business so is it a collaborative thing or not and and why i ask is that in in some of the the literature i've read around leadership that you can have some of the best thinking and best communicators in the world but if they're not taking their people with them then it's hard to achieve a vision if, if your people aren't there with you, particularly if you're in a big organisation. But in a smaller scale organisations, when it might be the entrepreneur and one or two other people or a very small set of staff, that, that um, the amount of pressure on the, the person, uh, he or she, has to endure is because they don't have the quantum of people to be able to help realise a vision or realise what innovation might look like, but might be different in a bigger organisation. So from from what in your travels from what you've seen how but what does that look like is it is it the person the entrepreneur or is it um a whole of organization effort for want of a better word mm, i think i think again um similar to my previous response it can work both ways collab you know i'm a big supporter and advocate and uh leader some you know le- leader in some regard or in regards to collaboration and a big believer in the power of a collective that are aligned with clear vision and values and motivation to achieve something together. Um, However, collaboration and and bringing everyone along for the ride with you can also take a lot longer than really entrepreneurial, quick thinkers, innovative people uh, can handle. And so that collaboration can also call hamper innovation in some way, shape or form. And so I think you need to, depending on the the skill set and the characteristics and the personalities of the people within the organisation, I think you need to have the structures and systems set up to enable both. Um, and I'll give you a, I'll give you a direct example. So AIM um, is set up by one of the most entrepreneurial, innovative uh, brave, bold, big thinkers I've ever met, a, a young guy called Jack Manning Bancroft, who I've worked really closely with for a long time and know really well. And he founded AIM when he was a 19-year-old uni student. He's an Indigenous young guy himself because he was sick of answering the question why there aren't more Indigenous people like him at university. So he wanted to go and do something about it. So he started mentoring some Aboriginal kids at the high school down the road from the University of Sydney, and that's where it was born. 15, 16 years later, it's now a multinational uh, volunteering movement connecting university students and marginalised high school students from different backgrounds across the globe, trying to, trying to connect those two institutions and, and give more opportunities to um, disadvantaged young people. And he is the type of person who comes up with new innovative ideas probably on the tick of a clock every minute that goes around the hour. Um, And that is really, really challenging for some people within the organisation and around the organisation to really understand and be a part of. However, the people that are able to, um, to operate like that can move with him and adapt and evolve, which have given the organisation the ability to achieve what it has over that time. And when I was in the organisation five or six years ago now, I saw my role as the general manager as being the elastic band that worked between Jack as the founder and the CEO who ran off in different directions and the rest of the organisation who were trying to do everything they needed to every day and keep up with him and stay connected as what was going on. And so my role really was that, that middle point to keep those two, not too much tension that things snap, but not too close 
in which we weren't able to shift and adapt and evolve in the way that we needed to. Yeah, that that sounds like that's like sounds like trying to herd cats. And I, I can understand I can understand this because I've I've had discussions with uh, individuals in my travels. Uh, if this is of any value for those listening, that um, sometimes when you're with that ideas person or that person that is definitely not the details person, but is out there pushing different ideas that uh, you're working at different levels. And so I think in that sense, someone like like him is, is that archetype of he's out or, or if it was a she, she's out there uh, working and, and creating new ideas and possibilities, but they're not the details people. And so they're one of their strengths is to identify who can be the leader and the operations type focus person to do the day-to-day minutia that they don't want any involved with because it doesn't float their boat, which is nice for them, but not not so much necessarily nice for you doing that job because you're, you're stuck in, you're stuck in that world where you have to try and mediate expectations of people that want a nine to five set, course and goals to achieve where you've got someone out there pushing the boundaries all the time and that that would drive me absolutely nuts um sorry to interrupt Eric. i guess it comes back to the to the beginning of my answer there it really depends on the people that you have in the roles that they play and making sure that that's right and if you're able to attract and recruit and train and develop those people then then you can find that sweet spot but if you've got the wrong people in the wrong roles then those things easily unravel and become really difficult. And so I think it's a it's a combination of all those things, not not one way is right or wrong. Someone above you that um, will pivot at a moment's notice, then not being able to see that come in, be able to manage that could be a difficulty. So no, I, I get that. Uh, mate, we could we could talk about this for hours, but I, I, want, I, I want to go through the questions. And the one that stands out for me here. Um, and, I, and I, I'm going to delve into this more and more in the podcast is this idea around the lonely road of leadership or entrepreneurship. Is it as lonely as as some people say it is, or is it as isolating and lonely as you make it? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a funny question because there's so many stereotypes that come with leadership and founding organisations and all of the jazz that goes in the middle of it. And I'm in a beautiful position at the moment in which I've got a lot of time and space to be able to reflect on, on the last decade and what's, what's happened because I've, I've sort of taken a bit of a different path. And so I don't have as much of the pressure and intensity um, and busyness of being a CEO and leading an organization right now. Um, which is a choice that I've made. And it's, it means that I can reflect, reflect and look back on those times and, and look at what I've learned and what have I experienced and what does that mean to me now as well. And, and actually, to, to be completely honest, I feel like um, stepping away from Batir where that became so much of my identity and who I am and um, how I operated and who I interacted with and what conversations I had each and every day, stepping away from that has um, made me realise how much interaction and how many people uh, became that leadership journey for me and that part of my life. And so I think you do, it is very easy to feel lonely and feel the pressure of leadership and entrepreneurship um, when you're living and breathing it day to day and you've got the blinkers on and you're just getting done what you need to and everything comes back to you and the, and the, the buck stops with you or the, the pressure is, is on you until it breaks. Um, but actually when you, when you take time to reflect and look around you, there are often so many other people out there that are supporting you, backing you, wanting to be a part of what you're involved in, that your community and network is, is really strong. And so there are, there are times that I now really miss the, the opportunity to rock up every day and work with a group of people that, I, um, that were so passionate and so committed and so supportive for us to achieve what we wanted to on our own. And, for me to be the leader of that. 
Um, whereas now I get to play um, great roles within organisations to help um, other leaders be able to do that. And I also get time for myself and my family to do what I'm trying to do now in, in starting and growing and, and building a family. And so, yeah, I guess in, in relation to that question, I don't think leadership and entrepreneurship is lonely. I think it is high pressure and high intensity. And so you need to put the, the tools and the practices and routines in place to look after yourself, to be able to reflect um, and appreciate the position that you're in and the opportunities that you've got to connect with so many great people around you. Thank you. And it's, um, you, you mentioned it a couple of times and it, it obviously is important for you like it is, I guess, for any anyone becoming a, a parent is that now that you've started your family, you have. It sounds like you're reevaluating some of what you've done in in your professional sphere, and I think we all go through that at different points in time. I I remember as a young parent, I I thought I thought I was ready for what was going to come, and I really wasn't. Um, we lived away from where my family is, and we thought we could do it all, and it wasn't wasn't necessarily the case, and it 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 didn't feel comfortable in my uh, circumstances because I grew up with a very big extended family and not having that where we were at the time and that was Canberra was a was a big um, a big uh, impediment to what I wanted to do in the future but yeah it, it's funny sometimes how um, and, and I, I can relate and I, I guess everyone can relate to this if they've been in leadership roles that sometimes life throws a, a curveball and I'm not saying that in a negative way that when your family comes along, it comes along and you, you either reevaluate or you adjust um, your circumstances to what you're doing in the moment. And that um, sounds like it's important to you and it's a good, it's a good thing to hear because um, I know people in my own life that um, family is probably, uh, this is in a professional context, obviously, family is about equivalent to the importance they place on work and that, that can have consequences down the track and each to their own you know I'm not putting a value judgment on it but um, I know there are there are the consequences for thinking that way down the track for for people and look I, I like you I've made choices I've, I've worked in the industry that I've worked in for a long time because and getting back to something you said before there's a measure of getting buzzed and energized by the work around you and the people that you work with and um, I think most people can relate to that if, if they like being around other people, I guess. Sam, let me ask you the next in the next theme is around measures of success. What's a measure of success for you? And, and let, let's take it from a leadership perspective. What, what things indicated for you you were being successful and effective as a leader? Yeah, it's a good question because you... You know, in, in a role as a, as a CEO with a board of directors, you're, uh, you're measured on a lot of different things at a lot of different times. And to be honest, it was one of the most difficult things for me was to, uh, to maintain composure and positivity through, uh, through board meetings um, when you felt like you were just getting grilled on every decision that you made, even though you've put everything into it. But, um, but measurement and evaluation is incredibly important, especially in the nonprofit world, because you're, you're working with philanthropic money, corporate donations, individuals, uh, hard-earned cash that they've decided that they want to put towards the cause that you're that you're leading and so you want to make sure that that is being used as effectively um, as possible and that you're measuring that and and communicating that and so you know one of the one of the actual you know there's a couple of things here I don't, the first one for me is having a really clear strategic plan that you engage with and measure and share throughout your team consistently. So I'll give a plug to Waterfield Consulting and their platform called Strategy Connect that I've used throughout AIM and through Batir and in other formats with other incredible organizations to put structure and framework around organizations that are achieving, that are trying to do really innovative and different things and being able to use a platform that clearly articulates your, your goals and your milestones throughout the year and over the years uh, so that internally you can track your progress, but then externally you can report that as well. So, you know, that's the boring answer is, is having that, that system and that structure and that framework and process in place to clearly measure what you're trying to achieve 
um, and be able to communicate that and, and learn and reflect from that. I think the more intangible one that I recognised was having people in roles around me that could do their job better than I could do it. If I was able to sit back and, uh, and look around me at the people who are in their roles and, and with authenticity and with try and remove ego as much as possible, know that they could do their jobs better than I could do them, I think that was success for me. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, I, I didn't expect a, a different answer. And in, in fact, um, it's quite a typical response that um, you, you, you've got your KPIs or your, your typical measures of success and in that not-for-profit world uh, where, yeah, you're managing other people's money. Um, I can understand why you, you need to um, find ways to demonstrate accountability for managing that, those monies um, in, in the not-for-profit space that I work in, membership-based um, volunteer organisation that, that people pay to belong and, and you're using their their hard-earned dollars to, to do something on their behalf. So, yeah, fully understand. Can I give you a third one just quickly? Yeah, Can please. Yes, I think the third one is externally um, opportunities coming to you and and people be becoming more accessible. So other CEOs, other leaders, potential partners, potential funders, picking up your call the first time or calling you back pretty quickly. And then uh, you're, you're talking about your street cred, sir. And that, and that, and that, that comes, uh, that comes over time. That um, comes with success. It does, but it also comes with the, the idea that when people deal with you in a professional capacity, that they know they're dealing with someone when they have a conversation, what's on the record and what's not. Mm -hmm. a record and and i i found as time went along I, I wouldn't mind testing something with you here actually is that i've i've, I've and I, I obviously won't mention the conversations but mm -hmm. to to the extent that i can generalize here that i've had discussions with people at level and senior um in government in the corporate sector in in the field that i work in that you, you get disclosed things that you never thought people would mention to you over a phone call or over yeah. a Skype call. And I think that happens when they know that there's a degree of trust there that none of this stuff is going to make the six o'clock news or suddenly you're not going to ambush them with something no one else knows except you. And uh, people take a punt there. And if, if you don't break that confidence and trust, it builds your credibility in the minds mm -hmm. of the people that you work with. As soon as you break that to any degree, then your reputation suffers accordingly. And um, I, it's, it's an interesting thing you bring up because the, this idea of, of keeping Chatham House rules when you're talking to other people, when you're in a leadership or even in an entrepreneurial role, I would hasten to add that you've got to be able to have off the record, comfortable and uncomfortable conversations to make your job work. Is that, is that fair call? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just having to think about it. I think things like Chatham House rules and off the record potentially have negative connotations to them as well. Tra transparency and honesty are big parts of my leadership style. And so I'd hate to think that by saying that people thought that they could say things that were inappropriate to me and they wouldn't get they wouldn't get followed up on or they wouldn't have a have a proper conversation around it. So I think sure. it's just just a bit of that ambiguity around those those that terminology that I'm I'm thinking through and why I'm hesitating I guess a bit with my response I think the comments that you've made about being trustworthy and people knowing that they can have a conversation with you and share whatever they need to and it'll stay with you if it needs to um, is incredibly important I think also what came up for me in my mind that I think is really important is that as a leader in my from my perspective you can never engage in gossip and hearsay and uh in organizations and in society and in communities we we thrive on gossip for the record that yeah I, I didn't mean to go that down that track i meant um talking in the context of you talking professionally that there will well, yeah. be things that will be disclosed that, that need to stay with you and yeah if in, in my thinking and I, I think you've reflected that that definitely something was illegal or or not kosher the conversation would stop for me it would stop because you, you couldn't go 
beyond that, yeah, but definitely not engaging in, in things like gossip and just um, rumour mongering. Is, yeah, yeah, that's not what I meant. I, I guess I meant that there has to be a level of, of trust that you can discuss things that need to be discussed. And uh, I guess in some, in some situations, and uh, this has occurred with me, sometimes people talk about things that are not necessarily related to your role, but that you build enough trust that the person can talk to you and create that relationship. So tr it's always building of trust is what I'm trying to get at here is that that, mm -hmm. that becomes very important to do your job because if you maybe you can speak on this, it would be interesting to hear what you've got to say that I found it um, eminently uh, important that when I get a new board of directors in my business that you have to get to know them quite well, quite quickly and build a rapport and start building that sense of trust so that you can work with them because it's these people that you're going to have the most time with to get outcomes in the business. Does that, does that ring true for you? Yeah, definitely. Whether, whether it's board directors, whether it's team members, whether it's funders, whether it's suppliers, partners, whatever it is, I think, you know, within the professional context, we've all got such limited time that, you really need to operate rapidly and building of trust and credibility in that relationship um, is really a measure of success of whether you're going to do transactional business and be successful one off or have a long term relationship that benefits everyone involved. Yep. And I think that the key for me is in those relationships, being the person who is able to have a empathetic, open conversation that needs to happen that's often difficult and uncomfortable but is the conversation that needs to happen not telling people what they want to hear and trying to make friends and that that is a really difficult line and a really um, challenging line to um to walk or, or dance along um because you don't want to piss people off you don't want to be a dickhead you don't want to be a dictator um, but people are going to follow you if they know that you're going to tell them what needs to be told in a way in which is empathetic to their situation and what's important to them as well, um, the work that we've done. And so, yeah, it is, it is a, uh, it's a challenging situation to be in, but also probably the most rewarding. Leader capabilities. So g give me your top five if you have five, if not three or two or one whatever the magic number is, I don't want to limit you, obviously, but what do you think are the most critical leader capabilities you've come across? And, and I've, um, if you want to differentiate between that and entrepreneurial capabilities, go ahead. But the, for me, what, what are those core elements in a leader? When you say capabilities, Eric, are you talking about skills or qualities or both? I'm talking about things like strategic thinking. I'm talking about things like uh, um, ability to apply foresight in the role, good communicator, influencer, that, that's sort of the perspective I'm asking, yeah. I think there are some core basic key requirement or whatever it says on the job description, that, that section at the bottom that people don't usually look at, which, which get you to the starting point. And there, I think the things that you just mentioned there, um, strategic, strategic vision, ability to set a plan, uh, measure performance, keep people accountable, communication skills, ability to, to pitch an idea, to sell, to build relationships, the, the skills and qualities around building a team, recruitment, finding the right people, bringing them on, vetting the people that don't fit, training, development, all of those things, like those core capabilities within an organisation, a leader needs to have all of those if they're going to be good. I think to go from, you know, to, to um, steal, the, uh, steal the title of a, um, of a pretty famous leadership book, to go to good from, from good to great, I think you need to have some core qualities in the world of leadership as it is at the moment from where I've seen it to really take yourself to that next level. And I think that comes down to the individual qualities around um, self-awareness, around authenticity, around knowing who you are and being able to be empathetic and listen and learn from other people, the strength of vulnerability and knowing when to share parts of yourself and when to hold those back to help inspire and take people on a journey with you and when to hold those things back to either protect yourself and 
and um, support yourself uh, and not open yourself up too much um, because it is a very, um, very challenging role that people to come at you from, for a lot, lot of different directions. Um, so I think, I think, yeah, in answer to your question, there are some probably four or five key capabilities that are, that are baseline without them don't go for the job. But if you want to go from getting in the door to being able to inspire and lead a movement of people to achieve um, what should be a pretty significant, incredible vision within your organization um, or whatever you're trying to lead, you need to tap into some of those. I don't think they should be higher level, but maybe more personal qualities that I think really make a great leader. It's, um, yeah, I guess I've, I've, I've not struggled is not the word, but constantly, uh, because I'm, I'm still in the throes of doing some studies myself that um, I'm constantly sort of asking the question, what, 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 are, what's the mix of those capabilities that make for the most effective uh, leader and um, still having conversations around that. But yeah, I'll, I would agree that you've got to have some core capabilities there going into a leadership role. And I think industry context matters. Yes. So if, if, if you are a very good strategic thinker, you, you can plan and look at possible futures, but you're not a great communicator. Some industries, you, you need the communication bit in some ways, being able to talk to people and get them to understand where you're going is, very, is a very critical part of whether you succeed or not. But in, in industries or vocations where you don't really need the tick off from the followers, they just need to see the pathway and you let them go because they've got the professional capacity to do it, I, I think it really it, it really is a it changes industry to industry. There'll be some dispute around that, but um, you know the, the the thing that comes to mind is a lot of times people say if you're a leader in one industry or you're a CEO, you should, you should have the the ability or capability to move into any industry and be a CEO. I don't I don't believe that. I, in some industries, I don't believe it. So an example, if you're a CEO in let's say in in my neck of the woods in advocacy and you went for a job in aviation for example if you don't have a background in aviations in that industry it's going to be very difficult for you to be as effective as a as a as a rival potentially going for that job however and this this is a bit um that i I think people don't talk enough about is um, let's say let's say you were the person going for the role in in the aviation industry and you didn't have aviation in your background but you've got all these other magnificent skill sets that you've been talking about on this podcast that uh, when people recruit are you recruiting based on part only past performance or should recruitment also be about what's the potential of this person in that job if we recruit them what what could they bring to the role that is not there right now that could be something that could be very beneficial to the place so uh, benefits and future impacts on the organization is not typically how we recruit and them them maybe a hundred different good reasons for that but um, I could probably find a hundred good reasons the other way to argue why not Mm -hmm. why not recruit on talent and ability to build and grow into a role Um, again there's some risk with doing that but Mate, I think it's a risk every time you look for people. It's it's always uh, there's always a slight gamble there. If 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 recruitment was a perfect science, you wouldn't have the recruiters, the amount of recruiters that are out there now, and constant competition to get what people consider to be the right uh, person. And that that's again, that's a whole nother discussion we can have. Sam, I want to talk to you about nature versus nurture. It, and so here's the question: Are leaders born or are they made, mate? I think you're lucky to be born with the the skills and capabilities and values and morals and ethics that come from um, from your parents and your family and your community around you. Um, but then it's what you do with those and how you invest in those uh, in the long term that then give you the opportunity or the potential to lead. Um, so that I, I recognise is not a direct answer to your question. Um, I think to try and to try and sum it up, I think leaders are born 
but not all born leaders go on to lead. And so, okay. yeah, and, and that's fine as an answer. Uh, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, I, uh, I, I, I still, I think I'm still a fence sitter on this. I, I, I believe exactly what you said there, that there will be some people out in this big, bad world that are naturally gifted at, at, at this thing called leadership. And there are some that you could take and mold into very good leaders. And, and some people that have spoken with me, and, and um, I would hope that you've run into these people in your career pathway as well, that never believed they could be leaders and then they were mentored or they took the time to work on themselves and got to a point where they they became fantastically good leaders. I sit on the leaders of born fence, then on people around them and what they do with it uh, in terms of whether they become good leaders or not. Final question to wrap things up, Sam, uh, and this this one is a bit of hind casting, if, if I may. Uh, from from your perspective, if you would do this for me, that looking back on your leadership journey and in the entrepreneurial settings that you've been in, what would you say to a younger version of yourself about being a more effective leader? If anyone listening to this knew me as a teenager, they would be uh, they'd be throwing rocks at the whatever they're listening to the podcasts on, um, because I was at, I was an absolute rat bag of a of a teenager. I was, I was really lucky that I had a beautiful family, beautiful community, all the support now, but I, I just tried to cause as much trouble as I possibly could and bring everyone down with me along the way. And a lot of things, you know, I really, I really regret and I feel bad about the way in which I behaved and interacted and treated people at times. And so um, I, I think looking back at that version of myself, I, I would just encourage myself to be more more kind to myself and and other people around me. And I, I think in terms of in terms of a lesson lesson or a way to live your life, I think um, I think that's probably a pretty good one. You know, lis- listen to yourself, check in with how you're feeling, be kind to yourself, be kind. Like all of the opportunities I've gotten in my career and in life is because. I think I've tried to be, you know, after that stage in life, I've tried to be pretty nice and compassionate and caring and genuine with people. Um, and and that, is, that has given me the ability to do what I have and, and live my life the way that I choose to live it right now. So I think if I could have been more conscious about that early on, I probably would have um, saved myself uh, hurting and or uh, negatively impacting some people along the way. Brilliant, Sam. Thank you for that and uh, a very positive way to end the podcast. So uh, for those listening, I've been speaking to Sam Rafshorgi. Mate, thank you for your time. And I do I do appreciate the, the candor of your responses here. And I guess one thing as a final thought from me on the podcast is that a lot of us, mate, were um, uh, not the best human beings in our teenage years doing things that we probably, or not probably, that we regret. And uh, yeah, I think it's a, a sign of maturity and leadership in anyone to be able to say out loud where, in whatever context that happens that you regret some of the things that you did because uh, you won't regret everything, obviously, but um, that you're, you're trying to be the best person you can be. And that I think is a product of time um, and um, I think it is, uh, it's a function of, of the, the better leaders that I think I've met in my travel. Not I think that I know that I've met in my travels that time is one of those good teachers and, and, and uh, being able to be reflective and be introspective is one of those. Uh, when you talked about capabilities for me, um, being being able to be introspective and to be able to tease out those things that you need to, to work on about yourself, whatever that may be, is a is a big indication that you're you're getting better at the craft, whether that's being a good leader or a good entrepreneur. Um, so Sam, thank you for your time, man. Thanks, Eric. I really enjoyed it. And there you have it. Thank you for joining me and a very big thanks to Sam Rafshorgi for his time. As always, and with all of my podcast guests, cannot thank you enough for giving up your time to speak with me and to help create what is an open source leadership 
learning tool, education tool for want of a better term. If you want to learn about leadership, want to understand it from multiple perspectives, get onto the podcast, listen to these fantastic individual leaders and entrepreneurs from across Australia and from some of my guests uh, overseas who've given of their time to talk about their pathways in the leadership space. For those listening, as always, you can follow the podcast on LinkedIn through Podbean and other uh, podcast streaming services, or you can get onto YouTube. If you can, get on and subscribe, like the podcast, potentially leave a comment. That's it for this week. Another couple of podcasts to round off February on the way. Some very interesting guests and issues around this thing called leadership to discuss and a very big March and April in terms of podcast content. Have a great week. Have a great rest of the month. And I'll catch you all on next week's podcast.